As you know, my dear people, we're in this season of penitence. The church directs our attention to Christ in his passion and death, seeking to educate and inspire us as to the gravity, the relevance of our sins by contemplating with us Christ in his sufferings. We know well that Christ suffered because we are sinners, even if we cannot think of ourselves as the worst of sinners. Christ would have had to suffer even if we were the only sinner because only God's own Son could atone for our sins, even our venial sins. We ourselves could not make sufficient satisfaction for because of the fact that they are offensive to the infinite God and require a victim of infinite perfection to atone for them and to make oblation for them. During these days, the Church directs our attention to the mysteries of the Rosary and the way of the cross, and today it may not be useless to consider the first of the mysteries of the Rosary, that is, the sorrowful mysteries, namely the agony of our Lord in the garden. I'm sure most of us have often called to mind that scene, Christ, on a moonlit night, like some gigantic spotlight focusing on him in his desolation. He leads the eleven apostles out of the city where they have had the Last Supper, down the hillsides that slopes away from the walls of the city into a garden called Gethsemane. It was a garden owned by friends of our Lord, a family, very likely the same family who hosted Christ's Last Supper and who often gave him a place to stay in the city, a meeting place, the family of St. Mark. As they enter little gate to this place, Jesus bids eight of the apostles to wait there. He takes Peter, James, and John further in. A stone throw, one of the evangelists says. And then leaving these three, he goes further still, but not out of earshot so that they can be the witnesses of this terrible ordeal, the hours or hour of his agony. Jesus experiences this because he must, and he allows them to witness it because they must remember. They must remember so that we might know mood of the Savior all evening has been one of profound seriousness and soberness. First words practically of the Last Supper were, my soul is sorrowful even unto death. Surely all during the Last Supper, Jesus is oppressed by what is to happen. And he has scheduled this hour of prayer for himself because
because he knows he is going to need the strength that prayer gives him. But as he prays for strength, the thoughts of the coming sufferings flood in upon him so that as if to wrench from him his sufferings incite him to plead with his father to spare him. He prays repeatedly, Father, if it be possible that this chalice pass by me, not as I will, but thy will be done. And his spirit grows heavier as he considers what he is going to suffer, the terrible degradation, pains, the injustices, the accusations, and that unspeakable torment of the cross. But these are not his only thoughts, or let us say his sufferings are not considered by themselves. It is as if they were inextricably related to the reason why he must suffer, namely sins, all men's sins. And there flow in upon his spirit many of the sins of men that have to do with their own souls, their minds and their wills, sins of sinful intention, sins of want and desire, sins of relentless hatred or revenge, desires for sinful pleasure. As he considers the whole world's terrible account come for him, we may say, how can this be? How can it be that Jesus could consider so much in such a short time? We have to consider that Jesus is God. And he, by the power of his own divinity, could call up before himself this terrible history of human rebellion. The day will come, that is, on our judgment day, when our whole history will also be projected before our memories. We will be forced to recall our pathetic history. I say it, of course, hoping that it does not prove to be that. But now is the time to consider what we are, what he found us to be, and what we made him suffer by what we now do. Jesus considered wickedness of sins, especially of unrepented sin. He saw it in its true gravity, in its true wickedness. He saw the great tragedy of scandal. Remember that every sin that we commit has that aspect to it if another witnesses it or if another is likely to commit it or be less resistant to it because he sees us in the process, particularly if he is younger and impressionable. He sees those who refuse to forgive others. He sees the terror of those who have lived their lives carelessly and now 
gaze into the jaws of unforeseen and unprovided death. That moment of despair. Not that they should despair, but that they do, because they have been presumptuous till then. He sees all the cold unkindness of every human being in the world, the lack of consideration, of thoughtfulness, lack of willingness of people to help others, the selfishness of those who spend all their time and all their energy upon themselves in order that they might not be without in order that they may not be uncomfortable or in any way desolate. He saw those who cannot believe enough in him to believe their sins have been forgiven. I'm sure you are aware that there are those who struggle constantly with scrupulosity and it is very painful thing, but it is not virtuous not to be able to believe that his forgiveness does lift their guilt. Scrupulous people also are usually very proud and are weak with respect to their faith. They're proud because they imagine their sins beyond his capacity. They flatter themselves with such thoughts. sees the guilt of those who go through life indifferent to his grace, indifferent to his truth, indifferent to what they are bringing upon others in the way of not only scandal, but just their own hardness of soul. Remember, Jesus suffered even for those who were going to be damned. It would have been altogether joyful for him to suffer for those who would be saved, but he suffers for all sins because all sins have to be atoned for if the human race is to be eligible for salvation, which is to say if no matter how terrible the sin and how gross the sinner, in order that till his death there be the possibility of his salvation, all his sins would have had to be atoned for by the Savior. Jesus has to behold and has to suffer for all the sins against his church, which is his body, all the heresies, all the indifference to his doctrine, all the lies that his enemies, whether in or outside the church, tell against his church and against his truth and against him. All the blasphemies that are hurled not only against his holy name and that of his father, of his mother, but against the church also. I trust you realize that in every age his church is defamed, his doctrine is misconstrued, and its history is distorted, lest the world know the truth, lest they come and be saved. He sees the scandalous materialistic, cowardly lives of bishops, mediocrity, and sometimes the laziness of priests, and he sees the callousness, callousness, and the indifference of lay people, and of all of them, of their repetitiousness in sin their unwillingness to surrender to his grace, to give it up, to reform their lives, 
rather their complacency, their willingness to go on and on in the same vein, never realizing that with each repetition there is more grace burned, their hearts grow harder, and their wills weaker. Sees also all the vile sins of mankind. Throughout history, as you know, men have debauched themselves with impurities. They have rendered holy marriage something ugly, something distasteful, or something that the world thinks amusing. Within and outside marriage, they defy or rather, they defile their sexual powers and they seek pleasure in most vile and ugly forms. As you know, this is the specialty of the demons of hell, and how they revel in bringing men down to this level. As Jesus considers all this horrible procession of crime and sin, it is as if he becomes the total victim of all the powers of hell, so that he is surrounded by it, immersed in it, so that it flows into his very being and threatens to tear him apart. And were it not for a great miracle of divine preservation, it would have done so. Even so, it squeezed the blood out of his body. So terrible was this oppression, this desolation, and this horror. The immeasurable, the uncountable history of human error, sin, and hardness. Just because, as I said, just because others are worse, we may be sure that we received our bit of attention. We were not overlooked or lost in the crowd. We also had our vote. The evangelist says that at the end of this ordeal, an angel was sent to comfort Christ. You know how it was. After a certain amount of time, during which undoubtedly Jesus is spread, is flattened on the ground, he returns to the apostles and says, What? Are you sleeping? Do not watch one hour with me. And finally he says, Sleep on now and take your rest. And then, as if to interrupt himself, he says, Rise up. He who will betray me is at hand. And when he meets Judas and the others, Jesus is again the picture of strength and serenity. He has accepted his Father's will. He has received the strength that he will need. He has already offered himself completely, and he is ready now to do physically what he has just done, mentally and emotionally. Let us, my dear people, during these days, turn our attention to these things, more real than the things that preoccupy us, more real than the things with which we make money, things that intrigue us, and surely that please us. These things will never cease to be, because the sufferings of Christ 
are everlasting in their import. If they were not, we could not be forgiven. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost.